Hi, this is Chris Woodfield with the Program Committee. I uh, wanted to thank you all for joining again for uh, day three of the virtual NANOG. Um, as always, uh, please remember to fill in your surveys um, with the new format. We're very interested in your feedback, uh, much more than we usually are uh, right now. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Bill Woodcock. Uh, Bill is the executive director of Packet Clearinghouse, which has provided the domain name service for .org since 2004. Um, he is also on the board of directors of CCOR, the Cooperative Corporation of .org Restaurants. And uh, with that, uh, thank you, Bill, and you have the mic. Thanks, Chris. Uh, howdy, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try to be fairly interactive uh, today. I've got some slides, but they're mostly just there to kind of give you a reference in case you want to dig further into any of the history of this or, you know, look at links or whatever. Um, so uh, please feel free to submit questions anytime during the session. And if it's some, about what I'm talking about right then, I'll try and work in the answer and uh, otherwise we'll, you know, aggregate them up and, and hit them at the end. But uh, I would like to, you know, do as much Q&A as possible. So, um, you may remember that there was a lot in the news from sort of last November up until until we had a pandemic uh, about .org and .org being uh, subject to an attempted hostile takeover by a private equity firm. Um, and so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the history of .org and why it's particularly interesting relative to the 2000 other top level domains out there. Um, it is the third largest of the GTLDs at 11 million registrants. Uh, so it's, it's a big and significant domain just from numbers perspective. It's also one of the uh, original uh, generic top level domains, which means it's been around for a long time and is sort of uh, very, enmeshed in what makes the internet the internet. And it's also interesting that, uh, you know, a lot of people think of, you know, .org as being, oh, you know, a bunch of little, you know, do-gooders, you know, off in the corner somewhere, but it's the United Nations, it's the World Bank, it's the IATA, right? Like international air traffic control is coordinated over .org domains. Um, it's the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders and, you know, thousands and thousands of other really large, significant nonprofits. It's also, you know, your kids weekend football league. It's, you know, the church on the corner. It's, you know, the neighborhood social club. So it's pervasive in a way that I think people don't often think about and they don't realize just how many organizations are dependent on .org for their online identity. So with all that, I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of background about how .org got to where it was, how it fell off a cliff, and how we <coughs> are sort of grabbed it as it went over and are hanging on to it by the back of its uh, pants or whatever. And, uh, and what next steps would look like to actually get it back on solid ground. Uh, so uh, .org is, was originally defined in RFC 920. Uh, that was back in October of 1984, along with the other, um, the other big ones, uh, ComNet, uh, Gov, EDU, MIL, uh, and ARPA with the Anatter in it. Um, it was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I have notes here that I can't quite see without, there we go. Um, so the idea was that it was gonna be sort of entrusted to someone to operate, but it wasn't gonna be their property, right? Operating it was a responsibility, not a prize. Um, and at that time, all of those top level domains were the NIC, uh, the, the DARPA Network Information Center was was sort of handling the registry for all of them um, and the DNS for all of them and so forth. And so then we've got a 10 year period 
when not much changes. Um, there are very few people on the internet. Most of those are at universities. Um, uh, you know, everybody is just waiting for OSI to come and kick the crap out of the internet because, you know, the internet is just a bunch of academics. Um, and then, you know, it starts to become clear that it's going to be something big and it is growing. We have the NII, the National Information Infrastructure Plan that privatizes the operation of the internet. Um, uh, and by 1994, it becomes apparent that, you know, a restructuring of some sort is going to be needed. And people are very excited about the commercial prospects of the internet at this point. So a lot of people are really thinking dot com is, is going to be everything, right? So a lot of worry at this point is that everything is going to register in dot com. None of the other top level domains are going to get used and they're going to have to find a way of subdividing dot com. Um, so you go from .org being the home for organizations and nonprofits and non-governmental stuff to miscellaneous TLD, uh, some non-government organizations may fit here, right? It, the, there's no change being described, but, you know, there's sort of an offhandedness to the way it's, it's, uh, assigned it, its use is assigned. Um, the important thing in the 1994 RFC, uh, 1591, is that the role of the uh, registry is is really much more clearly defined. Right, we go from a situation where there's sort of there's only one, and it's assumed that eventually there will be more to a situation where that, you know, more is almost imminent, right? Like everybody recognizes that everything's exploding and it's not just going to be uh, the internet doing it all. Um, so we see this phrase that, that uh, the registry is a trustee of the domain and they have a duty to serve the internet community. Um, and then there's this really specific language saying that rights and ownership are inappropriate ways of thinking about it. And, you know, responsibility is what you need to think about, right? That this is a responsibility to the internet community. It's not something that you own. It's not something that you can derive a, a private benefit from. So, you know, that said, um, we go, for a few more years, another eight years, uh, with the transition from the internet to network solutions. And network solutions is, of course, you know, a for profit company. Um, and um, sorry, I'll just uh, sort of flip through the slides here about the um, uh, how, how it's to be governed. The other interesting point here is that it's pretty clear in RC 1591 that changes in who the registry is dealt, what registry is, is chosen to operate .org are to be made or at least significantly made by the registrants, by the nonprofit community, not as a business interest, not by ICANN arbitrarily, well, sorry, it's not ICANN yet in 94. ICANN shows up in 98. But there, there needs to be a registrant-driven selection process. That's made really clear in, in that RFC. So um, then September 98, ICANN is formed uh, to take over the, the sort of domain name industry governance role. Um, be a home for the IANA going forward. Uh, and multi-stakeholderism is cited as the mechanism by which uh, governance decisions are going to be made. And there's a lot of talk about bottom-up decision-making and about the community doing the decision-making and that that is really the foundation on which um, capture is going to be prevented, right? That the community is in charge, so the community is not going to let somebody come along and capture its resources. Um, 
then uh, we get to July of 2002, and a deal is struck whereby uh, Network Solutions will keep the common net domains if they give up .org. Um, they're sort of given the, the choice of, of what to propose to do, and .org is the smallest of the three, the least revenue of the three, so that's the one that they say they're going to give up. And it makes sense, right? Because it's for nonprofits. Uh, you know, they already don't have .edu at that point, uh, which is the other sort of very specific one of these because .net, by this point, by 2002, people were already registering all kinds of junk at .net. It was no longer uh, just accepting um, uh, internet infrastructure the way it, it was defined to be. Um, so, the URL that's at the top of your screen right now is a really, really interesting read because this is the outcome of the selection process. And it tells you about how the selection process was run. I, I struggle to find a useful analogy that helps people outside the internet governance uh, community really get what this is like. But the best I've come across is or the best I've thought of is in a lot of countries that don't have their own space program, it's really prestigious to be the astronaut from that country or the first astronaut from that country. And so there's this selection process that happens in a lot of countries to pick the first astronaut for the country. And so there's there are criteria that get established, a lot of criteria. There are, you know, must be reasonably athletic, must be able to hang upside down, must not throw up in weightless whatever, must have first aid training, uh, you know, stuff like that. There's, you know, the sort of academic criteria, right? Must have a physics doctorate, um, must be willing to do press events, must be willing to go to grade schools and talk to kids and make them excited about it, right? Um, and so then, you get a sort of first pass of looking for volunteers, making sure that they sort of meet the basic criteria, and then you've got a beauty pageant, right? You've got a sort of a contest between all the candidates that meet the basic criteria to figure out which one is actually best, not just meeting the basic criteria, but actually the best of the bunch. And that's really what the process looked like in 2002. It was a multi-stakeholder process to develop the criteria by which the new registry would be selected. And a lot of criteria were put forward, some were dropped, you know, the multi-stakeholder process did its thing, and eventually we got to a set of criteria. And then uh, an RFP was issued and 11 proposals came in. And then the multi-stakeholder community went out and evaluated the 11 proposals against the criteria that had been established and they assigned points and the points were weighted and then you know we saw who got the most points so um we've got these um these sort of major criteria um and the first of these was differentiation uh and I'm not going to like read all this to you, but the upshot of this was they came up with this table of, you know, points assigned to different parts of differentiation and, you know, added up and so forth. And there was this really clear winner uh, called Unity, which was uh, uh, a joint effort by a association of nonprofit cooperatives and OS registry, the .au registry was providing the technical backing. Um, and you see, uh, you know, Newstar at number, uh, well, tied for number three uh, with ISC, Internet Systems Consortium, uh, then Internet Software Consortium, uh, and Internet Society at five, and, you know, a bunch of other uh, ones that were sort of thrown together in more of a hurry uh, further down. And then there was responsiveness. Uh, this is sort of looking at uh, how well the organization was proposing to 
uh, communicate with nonprofits about their needs, with the registrants, you know, see what they wanted and do it. Uh, again, big table, lots of argument, points of sign, so forth. Uh, and again, unity comes out as the, the highest one. Um, and then uh, there was support, which is how many people and organizations wrote in saying, yes, we're a nonprofit and we think this is the one that should be selected. And so they they had to kind of do this one a little bit more on the fly to, you know, once they got all the letters of support to say uh, what, how, how they would be sorted out. And so what they came to was this, uh, you know, class A versus class B endorsements and uh, class A were weighted five times as high as class B. Class B was sort of, you know, just random folks um, uh, or, you know, interested parties. Class A was actual nonprofit organizations that were .org registrants. Um, and so then again, they did this, um, this ranking. Uh, ISC uh, was really well known. Obviously the publishers of Bind, um, Paul Vixie's organization at the time. And uh, they were really well liked. They got uh, no nonprofits supporting them, but 420 individuals supporting them. Um, and Unity uh, came out number two. Um, and uh, ISOC uh, came out number three uh, because they got all the ISOC chapters to write in individually. And so all those got demoted from A to B because they were interested parties. Um, and so then you know, there's, and, and in this document, there's a lot of discussion of all of this, right? It's, it's, it's fascinating reading. I'm not gonna try and summarize it all. Um, so the question then is how did we wind up with ISOC instead of Unity, right? How was it that they picked uh, one from the middle of the pack rather than the points leader? Um, the answer is that there were 17 people on the ICANN board and seven of those were also ISOC leadership, and they didn't recuse themselves. And those seven included both the chair and the vice chair of ICANN at the time. So, you know, one hopes that if this process is run again, or when this process is run again, and we have a selection, that the good multi stakeholderism will happen again, right? That the multi stakeholder process will be followed, but that. ICANN will be a lot more cognizant of conflicts of interest and a lot more aware of, you know, who the, the, the stakeholder community is versus, you know, ICANN's role as a facilitator of the process, not as sort of the final arbiter. Um, so uh, it took a couple of years to actually get things switched over from, uh, uh, network solutions to um, ISOC created a subsidiary PIR, PIR outsourced to Affilius, Affilius outsourced to Newstar, Newstar outsourced to PCH. Um, <clears throat> kind of deep chain there. Uh, so it took a couple of years to actually get that to the point where it was working. Um, and then things basically ran relatively unchanged for quite a while. Now, if you poke around in the press from sort of December, January timeframe, there was a bunch of analysis of the public financial documents around .org number of registrants and you know how much was being charged and where that money was going because the, the publicly stated rationale for giving this to ISOC rather than to Unity was that Unity was just gonna operate it for nonprofits, but ISOC was going to take the profits and use them to fund uh, the IETF. And so at first, that was in fact a significant portion of the revenue. Um, but over time, it's become a trivially small portion. Uh, and, and the press did a fair amount of analysis of that. That, If you're interested, you can go dig into that. Um, Operational costs, you know, climbed over time uh, as the number of domains grew, but 
honestly, it's not so much about the number of domains. It's much more about how many people are trying to reach .org domains, which is proportional to the number of internet users, and even more, how much people are trying to attack .org domains. DDoS is what you have to build for, not actual DNS queries. If we're just actual DNS queries, all this stuff would be trivial, right? The, the number of actual queries associated with the, these things are you know, low in the tens of thousands a second, um, but you have to be able to, to withstand tens of millions a second uh, in order to keep everything working during the DDoS. So, um, so all that went along. Um, and during this time, during this you know, the better part of 20 years, um, ICANN went through a whole bunch of CEOs and a whole bunch of um, uh, turnover in the board. Uh, and I'll be really blunt, they got really, really captured by the domain name industry uh, during this time. So ICANN went from being something that everyone clearly understood to be a regulator in the public interest to something that looks a lot more like a club of registry service providers. Um, and so Fadi Chahadi was the CEO for a while. Um, he was the second to last CEO, second to current. Uh, and he spearheaded an effort to, uh, along with, with ICANN's legal department, to make all domains uniform, to treat every domain exactly the same way from a contractual perspective. Um, and this is really problematic, right? Because if there's not really a point in having multiple domains, if they're all going to be treated exactly the same, if somebody in .ca is actually in Mozambique, you know, .ca doesn't mean Canada anymore. If somebody in .org is actually selling tires, it doesn't really mean a nonprofit anymore. So that was stripped out. The, the price caps that uh, had been in place since the outset of the sort of commercialization of the internet, those got stripped out. But also the, um, sorry, cover that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, July 2019, July last year, the price caps get pulled off. Um, Fadi is already gone at that point. He has exited through the revolving door. And a day later, after the price caps are pulled, he registers the Ethos Capital uh, domain. And of course, nobody is really looking, so nobody knows or cares right at that point. Um, but there'd been this sort of long, slow bidding war of private interests approaching ISOC and saying, hey, that, that dot .org thing that you guys don't really know what to do with, um, you know, I get that you're making a lot of money on it, but we could give you a big chunk right now. And ISOC, you know, was sort of slowly entertaining these over time and not discouraging them, but also not quite biting. But then the the price cap being lifted, that was the signal that sort of sent all of those bidders into a frenzy. And so the offers went from being in the sort of 300 million range to, it turns out, 1.1 billion, which is interesting because before the, um, oh, sorry, uh, before the price was announced what what the winning bid had been um a lot of people looked at this and you know did the math and said well you know this should be somewhere between three and four hundred million dollars right that's a rational price and interestingly the banks that financed the private equity companies that that gave them the, the low interest comparatively low interest loans uh to make this uh, happen, they also came to the same conclusion. They weren't willing with a fully collateralized loan to loan more than 360 million. Um, and Elizabeth Warren's financial analysts came to the same number somewhere in the high threes. I ran the numbers and came to 405. Um, 
So that's what it was worth if you weren't going to strip mine, if you were going to try and operate it responsibly, if you were going to pay the operational costs without degrading anything and, um, you know, uh, not start selling personal data. So um, there are tens of thousands of folks wrote in. Um, one of the things that we figured out that's really interesting, and this is this is sort of a hack that anybody can do. ICANN has a correspondence web page, and people watch that. And any letter that you send to ICANN or any email, if you say you want it published on the correspondence web page, it goes on there, and people see it. And previously, nobody really used that very much. There was very little correspondence other than sort of technical rigmarole between the regulated entities and ICANN, but um, you know, a whole lot of big nonprofits wrote in and governmental and intergovernmental organizations that were in .org. And eventually the California State Attorney General <laughs> writes in and says, hey, I can um, remember the reason why you are an artificial legal person in California as a nonprofit is to operate in the public interest. And um, you're not doing that. So wake up. Um, but this conversation just keeps going on and on. I can keep sort of going back and forth with ethos, hoping that somehow magically they're going to turn into something good. Um, that of course doesn't happen. The California AG has to write a second time. Um, and then the ICANN board punted and said, well, we're not going to say yes to a deal that Fadi put together because that would be insider self-dealing revolving door, horrible corruption, blah, blah, blah. But you're welcome to come back with the next highest bidder. So that's where we are right now. Um, the, uh, the problem is sort of on hold. Uh, you know, the other bidders, whoever the second bidder was, uh, is undoubtedly having very interesting conversations with Andrew Sullivan. Um, you know, everybody else is presumably trying to figure out whether they can up their bid. Uh, and ISOC is undoubtedly, and obviously I can't speak for ISOC, but trying to figure out, you know, how long do they cool they, their heels before they, they bring the next thing back? Because their board voted for this unanimously, and they've said in a lot of public statements that, you know, there's no way that they would turn down a billion dollar offer. And, you know, when you get into a bidding war like this, people don't up their bids by a hundred million dollars at a time, right? Which means the second and third bidders are undoubtedly also well over a billion. So, yeah, let's um, let's go to Q and A. Um, what do you guys have? Um, shall I just? Is there anything to do towards reducing the influence of big domain register money in the yeah. system? Yeah. Well, I think the, the big one there is just what the California AG said. You know, this is supposed to be operating in the public interest. Um, if you can't show that you're operating in the public interest, the, the remedy there is it's not a legal person anymore um, and its assets get handed off to something else. Now, that's a hell of a big stick. Um, and there would be a lot of people who would be hugely pissed off at the U.S. government, not really understanding the difference between federal and state and blah, 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 right? Because the whole rest of the world depends on ICANN right now. Unfortunately, ICANN, we're going to have to cut off the feed. Uh, All right. Um, yeah, we're we're over I will time. Try and, I'll try and post answers to questions. Uh, uh, however, the mechanism is. Um, thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.